Welcome to The Economist in Your Ear podcast. Today, we're looking at something pretty huge happening in India, what some are calling an AI eruption. You've got American tech giants, uh, OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, Meta, all making massive investments. India is already the world's biggest consumer of AI services, it seems. But here's the real question, the tension we need to explore. Is India setting itself up to be an AI producer, you know, a launch pad? Or is it maybe heading towards becoming a giant data colony, just a huge test market that ends up fueling foreign AI models? That really is the core question. And it could shape, well, the, the whole digital economy in Asia going forward. Scale here is just staggering, which is why everyone's rushing in. You're talking about, what, 900 million internet users? Yes, second largest market in the world. Exactly. And U.S. firms already have such a foothold, right? Android's on like 90% of phones. WhatsApp has half a billion users there. So for them, rolling out AI features, it's incredibly fast mm -hmm. and uh, relatively cheap distribution-wise. Right. They don't need to build the roads. The roads are already there. They just need to drive their AI trucks down them, so to speak. And look at how aggressive they're being. Microsoft, for instance, just pledged, what, $3 billion? $3 billion, yeah. To expand yeah. AI and cloud capacity, specifically in India. And open AI. They're not just translating, they're localizing. Mm -hmm. Setting up an office in New Delhi, offering a cheaper chat GPT Go plan. It's around $4.60 a month. Yeah, something like that. They're clearly signaling that India is a priority, maybe trying to make it their single biggest market for users. But I think the most uh, audacious move, the one that really shows the strategy, is perplexity. That tie-up with Party Airtel. Oh, that one was astonishing. Perplexity Pro, usually $240 a year, right? You're right. And they just made it free for a whole year to 360 million Airtel subscribers. 360 million. It's, it's not really marketing. It's market acquisition on a massive scale, instantly. And it worked, didn't it? The download numbers just exploded. Oh, absolutely. Soared by almost 800% month-on-month mm -hmm. for Perplexity in India right after that deal. It completely dwarfed ChatGPT and Gemini growth in the same window. They essentially bought themselves a massive head start, instant entrenchment. Okay, but here's where I get stuck on the economics, it sounds like. Well, frankly, terrible business sense in the short term. How do these public companies justify giving away their most expensive product AI queries, inference basically for free or at a huge loss? Right, and that's the crucial distinction we need to make. You can't compare it directly to, say, streaming. Tech firms often charge much less in India. Netflix is super cheap there compared to the U.S. Like under $2 a month sometimes. Exactly. But AI inference, that has a real hard cost per query. It's computationally expensive, and that cost is pretty similar globally. Maybe around seven cents per million tokens is the estimate. Seven cents per million. Okay, so every free query is actually costing them money. Definitely. They are absolutely subsidizing access for these free trial users and on those cheap plans. They're losing money on each interaction, essentially. So... They're writing off potentially millions. The only way that makes sense is if they're getting something incredibly valuable in return. If it's not revenue, what is it? It's habits and it's data. But not just any data. It's incredibly diverse, high-quality training data. Think about India's user base. It's huge, yes, but also incredibly varied. Languages, dialects, socioeconomic backgrounds, tech literacy levels. It's messy. And that messiness is actually good for training AI. It's ideal. It's the perfect stress test. If your model can understand and respond effectively to the sheer variety you find in India, it's probably robust enough for almost anywhere else. It's a testing ground like no other. Okay, but hang on. Just because you get a user free for years, I mean, they'll stick around, right? What happens when that perplexity deal ends? Well, the stickiness comes from the continuous flow of data they get during that period. And what they're learning is fascinating. They're noticing, for instance, that Indian users really prefer to speak their queries much more than typing, yeah. especially newer internet users. That's a huge finding, voice data. Massive, particularly because a large chunk of people coming online might not be fully literate, they might not be able to read or write easily, so voice becomes their primary interface. And this ties into the India stack, doesn't it? That whole digital infrastructure. Absolutely. The government's public infrastructure, the biometric ID, the digital payment system, UPI, it's brought hundreds of millions online very quickly. And that provides, as the article puts it, precious and novel real-world data. Mm -hmm. Data that helps fine-tune these models in ways you just couldn't with purely Western data sets. So the infrastructure itself is sort of turbocharging the data collection for these foreign firms, which brings us to regulation, it seems. Well, it seems unusually helpful to this whole process right now, almost like an open door. It does feel a bit like that currently. 
You have the DPDP Act, India's data protection law. It generally permits cross-border data transfers. There are some exceptions, like for financial data mandated by the Reserve Bank, but broadly. Indian user data, the usage patterns, the voice queries that can be sent overseas to the U.S. mostly. So data collected in Delhi can train models sitting in California. No real technical block. Pretty much. And then there's the other piece, competition law, or rather the lack of it currently. Right. The government withdrew that draft digital competition bill. That felt like a big moment. What was that bill meant to do? It was designed to bring in what are called ex-ante rules, basically proactive regulations for the biggest digital platforms, the gatekeepers. Things like stopping them from unfairly bundling their own services or preferencing their own products, or crucially, tying data from one service to another. Can you give an example of bundling in this AI context? Sure. It would be like preventing, say, Google from making Gemini the absolute default, unavoidable AI assistant within the Android operating system or maybe deep inside WhatsApp. Got it. So stopping them using their existing dominance in one area, like operating systems, to force their AI product on users. Exactly. By pausing that bill, those kinds of checks are off the table for now. It means the big players have this window. An unusually easy environment, really, to push their AI features out through the platforms they already dominate. It makes it very hard for local Indian AI startups to compete. They risk getting locked out before they even get going. So putting those two together, easy data export plus relaxed competition rules, it's kind of a perfect storm for the foreign tech giants. It, it certainly simplifies things for them. They can grab market share and data now and maybe worry about tougher regulations later. It allows for rapid entrenchment. OK, let's push back on this a bit, though. Just having tons of users and data, that doesn't automatically make India an AI producer, does it? Mm. One source rightly said data doesn't equal destiny. No, it absolutely doesn't. Data is necessary, but it's far from sufficient. You need more. Simply having lots of Indian user prompts doesn't automatically create better sovereign models, models built and owned in India. Not unless there's significant local investment in, well, uh. in data curation, managing consent properly, uh. covering all those diverse languages effectively. And the biggest missing piece seems to be compute power, right? The actual processing capability. The government has the Indie AI mission, but how does that stack up? It's a start, a necessary one. They're funding public-private compute aiming for maybe 10,000 to 18,000 GPUs. Which sounds like a lot of GPUs. It is, but you need perspective. Mm -hmm. When you hear about the frontier training runs by Google or Meta or OpenAI, they're acquiring hundreds of thousands of the latest top-end GPUs, hundreds of thousands. Ah, uh, okay, so 18,000, while good, is small by comparison. It's relatively small, yes. For training truly massive foundational models from scratch, it's not enough. So what it means is that local Indian labs, like Sarvam AI or Ola's Krutram, they're mostly limited to fine-tuning existing models, often open-source models developed elsewhere. So they can adapt existing AI, but not really invent fundamentally new base models themselves because the cost of training is just too high. Precisely. Training those huge models requires immense capital expenditure, primarily on compute. And the local players just can't match the hyperscalers like Microsoft or Google on that front or on their established distribution. And it's not just about buying the chips, is it? There are deeper infrastructure issues. Oh, yes. Long term, you need to think about energy and where to put these massive data centers powering tens of thousands of GPUs consistently. That needs serious grid upgrades. It needs a huge commitment to renewable energy, too. It's not just about tax breaks for data centers. It's about fundamental infrastructure. That's a real bottleneck. OK, so if... India wants to avoid just being this giant test market and actually become a producer. It needs some policy guardrails, needs them now, perhaps, while it still has the leverage of all those users. What could those look like? Yeah, I think you can boil it down to maybe three core areas. First, data reciprocity. Second, treating language assets as public infrastructure. And third, scaling compute access smartly. Data reciprocity sounds like getting a fair deal. How would that work? It's about making it a two-way street. India could say, okay, fine, you can transfer user data overseas for training, mm -hmm. but if you use a significant amount of Indian user data, you need to provide transparency. Things like model cards, detailed documentation about the model, and clear data source disclosures. Showing their homework, basically. Exactly. Showing what Indian data was used and how. Plus, you'd need much stronger user consent and opt-out mechanisms specifically for AI training data. And the second point, treating language models like public infrastructure, like the UPI payment system. Yeah, think about Pashini. 
That's the government's program working on AI for India's 22 plus official languages, datasets, translation tools. What if you treated those core multilingual models and speech datasets as public digital infrastructure, standardized, mm -hmm. open, with fair licensing, just like UPI was for payments? So everyone could build on top of it, startups, right. researchers. Right. It levels the playing field. It helps Indian innovation flourish using India's linguistic diversity, and it reduces the risk of one or two big companies capturing those essential language capabilities. Make it a public good. And finally, scale and compute. More GPUs, but also making them accessible. More GPUs, yes, but it needs to be allocative, not just a fixed number owned by the government. Think about offering compute credits to startups and universities. Set up public queues so they can access this GPU pool easily, maybe even burst into the cloud when needed, without needing millions in upfront capital just for hardware. Lower the barrier to entry for local innovators. And you mentioned competition rules earlier. Uh -huh. Bring those back. Yes. Briefly. Those ex ante tools, the ones that proactively look at things like bundling AI assistance or making them the unavoidable default. Regulators need tools to step in before the market gets completely tilted, not just years later through lawsuits. OK, that lays out a potential path forward. The stakes, as we said, are huge. Is this AI eruption going to fuel growth back in you know, Seattle and Mountain View? Or can it genuinely power a sovereign AI industry in Bangalore and Delhi? That's the multi-billion dollar question. And I think the next six months, maybe a year, will be really telling. Here's what you, the listener, should watch for. First, do we start seeing these global firms publish real evidence, like safety docs or technical papers, showing actual improvements in their models, specifically for Indian languages, Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, code mixing? Real, tangible gains from using Indian data. Exactly. If it's all just silence on that front, then you have to suspect the data bargain is pretty one-sided. Data flows out, but the tailored benefits don't necessarily flow back in a transparent way. And the second thing to watch. Look at that Indie AI Compute initiative. Is it getting heavily used? Are startups and universities lining up, maybe even finding it oversubscribed? That would be a good sign. It would be a key indicator that the local ecosystem is maturing that there's real demand that people are trying to build, not just consume the AI being offered by others. Okay, lots to keep an eye on. And maybe one final thought to leave you with, thinking longer term. We talked about how expensive AI inference is, right? That per query cost. Could the eventual solution globally be more on-device AI? Running AI directly on phones, edge inference, to cut down those massive cloud costs and maybe improve privacy too. Makes sense. Less data flying around, lower costs. Well, if that's where things are headed, think about India. It's massive mobile-first user base. Mm -hmm. Could India actually drive that transition to edge AI faster than the West? Could that shift the economics of AI back in its favor? Something to ponder. Definitely something to think about. Fascinating possibility. Thanks for listening. Follow us for daily insights into world affairs, and don't forget to like, comment, and share.